Tonight we're going to be talking about how words impede, yes, impede successful communication. Um, perhaps there is a downside to determinate nomenclature, especially when it's being thrown into Facebook forums. And so threads may go south. Uh, they may be polemic. They uh, may create distance between people simply because people don't uh, understand what's going on. And so we're going to be talking about that and many other things tonight. If you have a question along the lines, please just put it in the comments section. And hopefully tonight you're relaxed and uh, ready to enjoy a good show because we have great people on. And uh, one of the things that I would like to nuance is we're not just committed to a process. And you've heard me say this over and over again. I'm committed to a process, not a conclusion. But with the understanding that we're working with conclusions and working through them. And so hopefully that's understood. But I'm not just committed to uh, a process. I'm committed to people. And yes, uh, those people are on this show and you. Uh, we want to present ourselves much like Jesus did. Um, and I don't care whether you're an atheist or a theist or an agnostic. My point is there's a passage in the Bible that makes sense to me. He's standing at the door knocking and many of the fundamentalists are simply saying, hey, he's knocking at the door trying to get in so he can save someone. But that's not the context. The context, if you look at it in Greek, is that he's simply wanting to have fellowship with humanity. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And so my question to you tonight is, have you ever knocked on humanity's door? That is, wanting to have fellowship with humanity. And in my mind's eye, I think that we can come together and have civil conversations and grow up together. Uh, would, that, would it not be best if we had a pluralistic community, people who were not given so much to an ism, but were given to different ideas? And we didn't try to say, oh, you know, we've got to have this argument here tonight and we've got to use my determinate nomenclature because it's the only one useful in the conversation. And so that's not the way that it works. Simply put, if we're talking about philosophy, if we're talking about truth models, we're talking about correspondence theory of truth, we can talk about coherence models of truth or theories of truth, uh, we can talk about consensus theories or deflationary uh, theories of truth. Uh, the same thing is true with knowledge. The same thing is true with faith. The same thing is true with belief. And so whether it be epistemic uh, or doxastic, etc., etc., these things are all over the place. And so I think it's best to be kind, patient, give people some breathing room, and yes, stand at the door and knock and say, hello, it's me. I'm a nice guy. I've got a cup of coffee in my hand, and I'm simply wanting to come in and, and talk to you. And so with that said, I'd like to bring in Bob Graves because he's He's a very special person to me uh, and my wife and to NCG and hopefully you because this guy really has has it together. I mean, he's the kind of guy that can laugh with you, he can cry with you, but this guy can think. I mean, this is, this is no typical person. This is a guy who's atypical. I mean, he's multi-axial. You can't pin him down as a theist or an atheist or anything like that. He's a human being. That's who Bob is, and he's willing to say, you know, some of me is A and some of me is not A. I mean, this is the kind of guy that uh, you want on your side, simply because he works with people, not against people. He works for uh, instead of against. And so with that said, welcome, Bob, to the show. Well, wow. I mean, with all that, now, now I'm under, under pressure. <laughs> I thought I could get myself together here. But, uh, yeah, no, it's great to be here. I enjoy the conversations we have. And, and this sounds like an interesting topic to me, you know, when, uh, when uh, words become an impediment to uh, communication. Uh, we, we, we don't realize it. Uh, and, of course, you know, in a sense, you, you and I, Dr. Jones, we're, 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 we're kind of cheating on this conversation because we have a background in linguistics. And so we, we, uh, we're familiar with what some of the problems and issues are with language and how we try to uh, minimize them. Uh, none of them are actually ever totally solved. They're just, they're, you know, but it, it, conversation, 
communication. What an amazing thing. Uh, we human beings have this ability that just no other species seems to possess anywhere near the degree to which we human beings have and this, uh, this, this ability to communicate. And yet, I think we can make a strong argument for the fact that a great deal of our communication is miscommunication. A great deal of our understanding is misunderstanding. And, uh, and we as a species, although we possess this unusual ability to speak and to communicate, um, the, the degree to which we're really isolated from each other is, uh, is phenomenal and, uh, and very, um, in some ways, uh, disappointing. Uh, but in other ways, perhaps uh, <laughs> relieving. It's almost as if we all have a need to connect with others. And we all have a need to kind of get away from everything else and and be to ourselves. You know, so we have this uh, this set of needs. But uh, yeah, we're, we we want to really talk about tonight how how you know words can also get in the way of communication. And I think this is. Uh, do you want me to go into this a little bit? Well, uh, let, let, let me state something, uh, yeah. because so many times what we are doing in language, we are working with some things, not all things. And if we can keep that between this ear and that ear, I mean, uh -huh. it would be useful. And so my point is words have usage, not inherent meaning. However, we do, uh, that is within disciplines, we put these determinate nomenclatures together for particular reasons, and it may be just for a particular argument. Over time, things change, uh, even uh, within the fields of science. I mean, sure. uh, w these these things have shifts, and uh, it, it, um, I'd like to get into a lot of it tonight, but I know that I'm going to be constrained because of time. We were talking just earlier because we were having a meeting that went past two hours, but it was fantastic because we were talking about the problems in education because typically what's being talked about is a syntagmatic analysis that is in language and how we communicate, and most of the kids never understand anything about the paradigmatic, and I was demonstrating that we can do some very simple things in first language acquisition, that is the period of time in which uh, people acquire in a different way than number two and number three. Um, and we can do things for our children and our grandchildren to where, uh, wow, uh, they would have a variety of ways of looking at things to where they could use language a little bit more efficiently because language is simply an attempt. It's a very weak attempt uh, at actually expressing thoughts, and thoughts are not equivalent to a language. And so it's, 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 it's a wrestling match in a sense. And so I want you to take off on this and go. Let me push sure. your button. Well, you know, uh, what you said there, you know, uh, the truth is we use a syntagmatic strategy in an attempt to bridge a paradigmatic uh, gap <laughs> True. In, in, in a very real way. Now, that's a little bit fancy of saying it. Let me see if I can come up with an interesting um, uh, analogy. If you've ever played charades, charades is a game, you know, where without using words, uh, you try to use a s symbolism and signing and behaviors to try to get people to come out with a particular phrase or some words. Well, you know, that's not easy to do. And, some, and sometimes uh, you get a great game going and you can get some words quickly. And other times it's like, oh, my God, you know, what are you trying to get us to say? Well, the truth is language actually works the exact same way in reverse. We're using words that we think possess such clear meaning. But we're really trying to convey an idea that, that, that exists in that charade, as it were. You know? So there's a sense in which conversation is the same thing as charades, but in the opposite direction. And, uh, and as a result, we, we use language. But a lot of people don't know what language really is. You know? uh, uh, and, and although we could, we could spend several hours talking about the phenomenon of what language actually is, just trying to describe uh, what it is as a thing. But um, in, in a very real sense, language is basically you know, somebody opening up their mouth, uh, interrupting their breath as they make sound. And these sounds then uh, get associated with, uh, with, with ideas that they are apparently referring to. So we use these words as signs that point to ideas and notions. And what we're really trying to do is we're not trying to convey words. We're trying to convey ideas. We're trying to convey thoughts. And these, these words are merely uh, conveyors to try to 
bring that thought from one mind into another. And, you know, studies of the human brain have definitely shown us that the way we think and the way we talk is very different. We think in clusters of ideas and conglomerations of ideas, but when we talk, we have to re, uh, we have to kind of reinvent our thoughts by turning them into some sort of linear sequence of sounds. And as a result, the only way to do it is for one sound to follow the next. And we then have to do that in a way where we maintain concord and syntagmatic uh, accuracy and what have you. But this is actually a translation process. We're not really expressing our thoughts as clearly as it may seem. But what happens, I think, sometimes when communication breaks down is when people think that the words don't have usage but that they have meaning, people think that when you're talking to me, you mean what you're saying, and that's not true. You're trying to say something that you mean using words that you hope will uh, convey that from your thoughts to my thoughts, and it's an imperfect process. And as a result, if I'm holding you to your words, the only way I can hold you to your words is if I hear the words you say and then use my lexicon, what I understand these words to mean, in order for me to understand these words. That's if I'm holding you to your words. But if I'm holding you to your meaning, what I'm trying to do is I'm asking the question, what's behind these words that you are using? What is it that these words are conveying? I'm not interested so much in the conveyor belt as much as I'm interested in the thoughts that are traveling upon that conveyor. And this is a deeper level of attempting to bridge the gap between you and another human being. And I think that, uh, that this is uh, one of the biggest problems of communication. Then we talked about determinant language. Now in a discipline such as what I teach, I teach sound engineering at a college. Uh, we have a lot of words that we use in, uh, uh, we talk about rarefaction, we talk about amplitude, we talk about uh, diffusion, we talk about absorption, uh, you know, we talk about wavelength, and we, we talk about uh, uh, the velocity of sound, and we, 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 we talk about how it reflects in a room, things like, we talk about a lot of scientific concepts of what sound is doing, uh, both in a room, and we talk about the anatomy of the ear. I mean, we get very technical. Now, when we do that, we do attempt to establish certain words that we, we try to teach the, uh, the expert at sound uh, how to use these words in just the way we want them used within the discipline. And so we try to come up with the determinate language. But the reason we try to come up with determinate language is not because all of the meaning that we could ever have is found in these languages, but rather these are words that help us to set a foundation of how the rules of the game as we converse things will be done so that we, uh, we try to develop a, a more disciplined use of these words rather than just an individual and creative use of them. So it helps us to communicate uh, a little bit better inside of a discipline. But human beings live real life and real life isn't anywhere near as disciplined as a science is. <laughs> and, and as a result, if I think that all words possess some deterministic meaning, then I'm not trying to listen to your thoughts. I'm trying to hold you to what I can pin you to the wall with. And, and in a sense, if, if somebody uses a word, like for example, on this show, many times we've had conversations uh, about God, concepts of God. We've also talked about agnosticism and theism and atheism. And some people want to define these words and then hold other people accountable as if human beings actually fit within these words, and they don't, not necessarily. These words are kind of summary uses of things that we point to in general to allow us to communicate. But I guarantee you, everyone out there who is perhaps theistic, everyone out there who is atheistic, everyone out there who is agnostic, uh, is, is, is what they are in a manner that is a kind of a unique combination of human <coughs> experience for their particular expression of it. And as a result, what those words mean when they use them to express themselves is not something that fits neatly into a box. It is something right. where the word as we tend to use it is uh, close enough for uh, government work to, uh, to express their ideas. Consequently, when somebody says, well, I'm an atheist. Well, if you're, if you're an atheist, then that means what you're saying is, no, 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 you can't do that. When somebody says they're an atheist, you really have to try to understand what do they mean by that when they say that? In, in what way 
we, we, that is that the word that they <coughs> find meaningful and useful to use. And, and if you're going to hold them to what you think are the strict definitions of these words, you're not really listening to them. So that, that, is, that would basically be my, my, my initial thought of how words can sometimes get in the way of our actually communicating with one another. I, I don't know. So that's my, little, that's my little rant. What do you think? That was good. That was good. You know, at, at some point, I, I would like for you to take uh, the issue of sound. And um, it's just like sight. Uh, so many times when we're trying to train someone to use a camera, they don't see the same thing that I do or someone else does simply because um, the eye, uh, their eye may not be as trained or uh, identical um, as what I see. And so uh, this becomes a very difficult process. Uh, I can show someone something and they won't see it until that eye is trained. And right. many people won't understand that until they understand something about photography. And the same thing is true of sound, by the way. That's that's my point. I yes. wanted you to nuance a bit with that simply because when we are speaking orally, I mean, there are a lot of things that are happening in the manner in which I hear, um, how I hear it uh, plays a role in this linguistic and non-linguistic world that we keep talking about. And so uh, perhaps you could deal with a bit of that uh, now? Sure. You? I, I can give you two kinds of examples of the, how that works. One would be linguistics and the other would be um, sound engineering. Okay, go for when it. When it comes to, uh, to linguistics, one of the things we've discovered about little babies between, uh, you know, be, between three and, and 18 months is that little babies are extremely uh, sensitive to all sorts of nuanced articulations that could come out of the human mouth. Uh, to a degree, we've, we've tested them, and we test them with a boredom test. That is, we find that you can um, take a baby, and you can, and, and once the baby gets to an age, which occurs very early on, where they like to follow your eyes, they also love to listen to the sounds you make with your mouth. And you can start making sounds until you bore them. You can, like, do something like this. Ta, 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 ta. And then first the baby will look at you like, well, you know, what's this all about? And... You can go tuck, 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 and eventually the baby realizes, well, you know, you're kind of stuck in the rut, and I, frankly, I'm quite bored, and the baby will look away. And then you can, then you can start going like this, boo, boo, boo. Well, now you, you're saying a new sound, and the baby will look back again, and if you keep that up after a while, the baby gets bored and looks away. Every time you change the sound, the baby uh, will look back at you again until it becomes bored. Well, you can do things like this. You can go tuck. Tuh, until you uh, bore them, and then you can change it to ta 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 ta, and they'll look at you again. Now, most of you who listen to me don't know the difference between ta and ta, but those are different sounds, and some languages actually have more than one t-like sound, and it's a significant difference. It's like a different letter to them. Well, babies, all babies, are sensitive to those two different t sounds, but. One of the things we notice is by the time a baby reaches the age of 18 months, they tend to hear most sounds that are human speech sounds as if they are merely another version of the exact same sounds that they're typically hearing in the native's tongue being right. spoken around them. As a result, if your language does not include more than one T, the baby will hear just this one T, and if you change the kind of T you use, you still bore the baby to death. That is, they don't reinvigorate their interest. So we've, we've done studies like this and many others to help us to determine that, that children, as it appears, um, uh, are very sensitive to a wide variety of nuanced sounds, but by the time they reach the 18-month uh, the period, they're really mostly sensitive to the differences in sound that are typical of the language being spoken around them. So, uh, and, and basically what's happening is they're losing a sensitivity to or an awareness of any nuanced differences because for the sake of clarity and speaking and acquiring language, you don't want to be confused just because somebody said something a little differently, you know, because uh, everyone's going to enunciate things slightly differently, a slightly different structure in their mouth and all that. So you need to hear all those T's as T's. You need to hear them uh, that way. Well, so we've, we've learned that linguistically, uh, in fact, by the time you reach the age of 27, 
if you have not overcome an accent in a new language when, that you've acquired after the age of 17, uh, you will find it almost difficult for you to hear clearly the language differences. Your brain has so nuanced the sounds into your native tongue that, that your brain actually is fooling you into thinking you're hearing certain sounds. You can't actually clearly hear the difference. Uh, and and the, the less exposure you've had to various languages, the more difficult that can be for you because everyone varies differently in their skills. So anyway, there's a linguistic example. Let me talk about a sound engineering example. Many people don't realize this, but we're not all uh, paying attention to the exact same features of any given sound. And as a result, sound engineers who are involved in recording various instruments, uh, they may have, they know what a trumpet sounds like, they know what a cello sounds like, they know what a violin sounds like. Uh, but uh, some sound engineers, if they've been around rock and roll all their life, uh, if, if they still have hearing, <laughs> uh, they, they might not be able to hear very clearly the difference between a viola and a violin. But if somebody who's been around violas and violins a lot will know the difference between them very clearly. Uh, a, a lot of people who've never been around uh, guitars a lot, they might not be able to tell the difference between the sound of a Martin D28 and, and, and of a, uh, say, uh, uh, a Gibson, uh, you know, Hummingbird guitar. They, 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 but they, they do, or a Tecmini, you know, these guitars do have some very different sounds to them. And what, one of the things that sound engineers have a difficult time doing is when they're recording and mixing uh, a song, if, the, if it's very important that they hear certain features of an instrument, they have to discover that there's various sounds that an instrument makes that they have grown so insensitive to, they don't hear it. They really don't hear it. And uh, for example, with an acoustic guitar, an acoustic guitar has a certain lower body to it that, that actually is coming out of the sound hole and depending on the size of the body of the guitar uh, can be more or less robust. But the guitar also has a very tinny sound, a very, very, very articulate sound that is coming out of the higher register. Some people actually listen to that higher register and don't really pay much attention to uh, the lower boomier sound. If they're a sound engineer, they might be recording a guitar that lacks some of that to be a more balanced recording. And that particular ear will have grown uh, uh, into a habit of not noticing it's missing. Or if it's too strong because of the, where the microphone is placed, there's this boominess. They might hear this mud and they might be wondering to themselves, where'd that come from? Now, you think, well, how could they do that? Well, that may seem weird to you, but, but trust me, we've discovered this, that when you're training a sound engineer, you discover there's all kinds of sounds they don't hear. Uh, now, it, they're certainly going to be very familiar with the sounds they paid a lot of attention to. But when you get to recording many things, you're going to start to record a lot of things you've never really paid attention to before. And to be a very good sound engineer, to make good, clean, uh, crisp uh, captures of, of performances and, and to mix things well and to keep the mud out, this requires developing a very sensitive ear to things that you don't normally hear. What this means is that this is true not just of sight and of sound, but the truth is we really don't pay attention to the reality around us that's even within the domain of the, uh, uh, of the limitations of our own sensory perception. Yeah. We, tend to, we tend to focus on certain things that we consider to be the priority, and we learn to ignore the rest. We learn to ignore the rest. And some of these things, not all of them, the human brain is of such a nature that when you've learned to ignore them, you can't hear them anymore so as to even develop a sensitivity to them, uh, some of them without great difficulty. Stop uh, right there. Stop right there. Sure. You get to the point to where you don't even hear them anymore. Uh, drill down a bit there because that's uh, very um, well, important. Uh, I mean, go ahead. Yes. Uh, now, there are some things that we notice about the plasticity of the human brain, that some things are very plastic and some things are not. Uh, for example, if you've learned to walk at a decent age to where you uh, developed a certain amount of coordination, and then later say you're in a car accident or something, there's brain damage and you can't walk. You can go through physical rehabilitation and depending upon how much of the brain still remains, you could make an entire recovery. But your recovery does not mean that the brain cells that were damaged have been healed, but rather other brain cells have kind of uh, taken over the, that and that's why you had to go through the physical rehabilitation to train those other brain cells to kind of learn to respond. And after a while, you'll walk again. 
Uh, and, and for many people, many people have learned to walk just as well as they ever did, fortunately. Now, also, uh, but a young child who's developing uh, visual abilities, there's a certain period of time for the toddler where you develop spatial um, depth perception called stereoscopic vision. If you are wearing an eye patch or you have an eye infection or something during that critical period, you will fail to develop stereoscopic vision with any kind of um, uh, efficiency. And for the rest of your life, determining how far away certain things are just by looking at them will be for you forever a problem. Your brain will not have the plasticity to kind of recoup that. And so what that means is that as we studied the human brain, there are some abilities that if you don't develop them or if you lose them, uh, well, they're gone forever. There are other abilities that if you don't develop them, well, later you can. And some abilities that if you've developed them and then lose them, you can redevelop them. So this is, and, and we're just still discovering uh, how the human brain works and, and just what fits into what categories. Um, uh, oddly enough, there's even an area of the brain that we know is involved in facial recognition. If you get damaged to that area of the brain, um, you, you recognize that human faces are human faces, but you might have a harder time saying, Oh, that's my brother, or or that's even my wife, you know, <laughs> uh, or or what? You know, it's, right. it's amazing. We don't realize that this is the way the brain organizes its perception. See, the As reason that I wanted the reason that I wanted you to make that point is because, you know, there is an argument to be made, namely with language apparatus, uh, that would be telling along the same lines. I mean. Sure. So, so many things can be lost, and then so many people just assume, you know, I'm walking around and everything's fine. But that's not necessarily true. Things are in flux, and some things we don't even know are going on, and as we're not getting any help for it. And so um, lots of things are happening, and, and many people are struggling and having problems. And this is why I keep encouraging people, be ever so patient and kind to people, you don't know where people are at. And so whether it be hearing, seeing, that is in this context, or trying to use, you know, language, the manner in which you receive that uh, has to do with, I, I keep making the argument of non-linguistic, a lot of times what, what the brain does, it's it's perceiving more uh, body language um, mm -hmm. than it is the oral that is oh, the context the of ear. language is, right. is extremely full of information and so it's, whenever we're communicating. Yes. And so if your language apparatus is, in a, if I can use that term, um, not to be too difficult, but if, if that becomes damaged, if you will, and, and you have to you know, relearn or go through therapy or of some kind, um, the, the things that you're suggesting concerning sight and hearing are also true uh, linguistically so. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And good point. I mean, here, here's here, if I were to say to you something like this, hey, uh, or if I were to say something to you like this, hey, now it probably sounded very much the same, but the look on my face indicated a very different meaning. You know, well, the, the second one was more like, uh, there's a line here, don't cross it. The other one is, I've got something I want to tell you that I think is kind of funny. You know, and yet I may have, the, the sound of my voice, just without the vision of my face, could have been very similar. And sure. yet uh, the, the expression on my face uh, alters the, uh, exophorically, the meaning of the words you're hearing. I so agree. And this is why I've argued for years that if we don't have the index quindictic elements and all the exophoric, ya, ya, ya. Uh, we probably can't reconstruct an efficient model, that is, that would represent the intent of these ancient authors of what we call uh, the biblical text. And so uh, you're putting some wonderful things on the table. Did you want to finish up a point before well, I yeah, go? Yeah, let me give yeah, you a, one more it. example yeah. of, of some of the difficulties we can have with even language. And that, I mean, English is an SVO language. Which by that, we mean that our, our typical sentences are subject, verb, object, order. Other languages are, uh, there's some that are subject, object, verb. Some are, I mean, they can appear in any order. And we've known some languages that uh, over time actually changed from one order to the other. Now, the human brain is certainly capable of acquiring a syntactical approach to language. It will use any of these orders. But it is also true that the older you get, if you then have to learn another language that uses a different order, 
you might forever be making constant grammatical mistakes in the new language because you're always trying to use this, the syntactical rules of the of your innate native language. Uh, I should say innate, I, I, but but you know the one that you first learned because because although the brain has this ability to uh, adapt to the grammar of the particular language you're learning and has a certain plasticity or or flexibility to acquire any one of those grammars that might happen to exist. Once you have settled into one, uh, the older you get, the more you are not only settled in, you're, you're in a rut. Right. And it's hard to get out. And so th th if this is not just true of language, right. this is true of our thoughts, our ideas, our paradigm, and our ability to even how we organize the reality that we experience. You know, I've had to explain linguistic raising over and over again, and, and some people don't get it simply because they're looking at just one axis. And when you, and when we are talking about syntagmatic uh, in linguistics, we're talking about um, something horizontal. When I talk about something paradigmatic, I'm talking about something vertical. And so, if I were to talk about, let's say, um, a predicate, and it's not just about order here. A paradigmatic issue becomes the major emphasis here, that is, of the speaker. Some people don't get that. And even in logic, um, we, we see this happening. And this is why it can't be as black and white as so many people are trying to put it. And so, yes, with various kinds of languages, we don't, um, it's not an issue of word order so much as it is, let's say, inflection. But inflection does not dismiss syntagmatic because if I say blepo, uh, every Greek spe speaker would understand that is morphologically speaking, that would be a present active indicative first person singular verb. I've just said, I see. So if I say uh, blepo, I see. But here's, here's the problem. If I say um, blepo, I see, or uh, kuo, I hear, uh, I hear and I see could mean the same thing in that I see, I perceive, I hear, I perceive. In other words, I hear you. Uh, we say that all the time in uh, English. If someone says, I occurred. see that, the same thing is, is meant. And so what we're trying to do is deal with meaning. And this is why when you're listening and you're trying to wrap your mind around surface language, you've got uh, surface structure, excuse me, You've got to look at the deep structure. When you analyze the deep structure, what is conveyed by the surface language or the surface structure, excuse me, um, you know, you, you've got to drill down a bit. And how this substructure or this deep structure is built is semantically. And this is why we have the semantic domain fields. And most of the time when you get into that, this is, you know, in language theory, how things, um, you know, produce meaning, and that is within the brain. And so um, it's it's not just about the speaker, it's about the receptor. This is right. why I enjoy so much of, uh, of your understanding concerning hearing. So a blind man can say to you, and meaning, <clears throat> uh, I see what you're saying. And, and also, <coughs> if, you're if you're texting somebody who's trying to explain something to you that is hard to get through, you can text back, I hear you. Correct. Uh, and, 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 of course, we realize in those contexts just what's really being communicated, which shows that these words can mean very distinct things or they can mean very similar things, even though very technically and strictly speaking, hearing is a different sensory perception than seeing. But they're both sensory perceptions, aren't they? And so they can both be used as an analog to having, a, having achieved some other form of perception. Right. You know... At times, I'm 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 really curious as to why people would author uh, various things in a certain way. For instance, if you do a Google search on root, uh, let's say root stocks, uh, someone can say root word. Well, what is typically meant with root word is much different than what we suggest with root stock. For instance, in Greek, we have 400 root stocks in the entire language. Uh, wow, that's just a small number. And so when people suggest that, you know, the root uh, possesses some kind of meaning, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, the root is simply working. Let me give you an example. I asked this question to someone 
I was debating uh, about 30, 35 years ago. And I said, if you take the word um, luo, you could translate that, and we can look at two different translations of that in English. Luo can be translated, I loose or I destroy. Right. It's a verb, okay? It's present active indicative first person singular verb. And so if I say luo, let's look at the rootstock here, lu, okay? Without its ending, okay? Now we have the rootstock here, lu. Um, does that mean destroy or does that mean loose? Well, it doesn't carry any meaning. It's got to have context, but not everything is contextually driven. And so there are many questions that have to be asked concerning root stocks. And so the application of them has much to do with meaning and blah, blah, blah. And we'll get into this issue of gener generative grammar at, at some point. But my point is, when people talk about, uh, you know, this root word, typically what's meant by it when people speak about it, they're simply talking about a lemma, a lexical entry, mm -hmm. namely, uh, let's say, that would suffice for uh, what we're, you know, trying to get the gist of. Um, does that carry or does that have embedded meaning? Not at all. But lexical theorists, what they do is the manner in which they uh, archive things, they archive things uh, historically. In other words, we're looking at the diachronics, namely of the word. So, you know, in 1892, the most popular usage of this particular word, you know, that's going to hit, you know, number one in a dictionary. But that doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, uh, the only usage. It just means that it's popular at the time, whereas it may come in number two or number three or number four or number five or six or number 232 in about 15 years. And so my point is, uh, words do not uh, retain uh, the same meaning. Uh, these things are in flux. Well, and, yes. and, and language is something that suffers entropy. And and many people think that, you know, there's just one idea there. No, there is the theory of entropy uh, and how that takes place and what it actually is, and that needs to be discussed. And so when we are having conversations, there's a lot more to this. And since there is, I think that uh, a lot of respect, uh, a lot of patience, a lot of long-suffering and, you know, kindness that needs to be employed. And so, yeah, you, let me give you a, a, another example go, go of one, one of these problems, and then and then try to suggest uh, an analog in the, when it comes to understanding. Uh, the the sound kshle is not a sound typically found in the English language. Kshle, um, you know, the the k followed by an sh within an l. Uh, you, maybe in German or some other language that might that might occur. But so every, every language tends to have a couple of, uh, you know, uh, sound uh, clusters that are typical to that language uh, in, in a particular, uh, f you know, phonemic syllable. Uh, so that th when they create their words, they, they tend to combine these uh, s syllabic commonalities. These syllables mean nothing in and of themselves at all. Uh, but when, when combined, we can sometimes use them for, uh, to, to mean various things. And some syllables actually do have meaning. Uh, we can talk about pot, but we might be talking about something that sits on a stove or right. something that, uh, that, 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 that sits smoking. <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, the word is there. Uh, and, and the truth is, though, that if you then go to another language that has certain combinations of sounds that are not typical to what you're accustomed to, you might find yourself substituting other sounds for them. But this is also true in understanding meaning. When there are ideas and meanings whose nuances I have not paid attention to, I will, when I hear somebody talking about this idea, package the idea they're talking to me about in terms of the idea I already possess. And if there's any nuance to difference, I not only might not pick up on it, I might not even be aware of the fact that I didn't pick up on it. And a lot of the, uh, the controversies and, and misunderstandings we have come from the fact that when I hear you, if what I hear you saying uh, it comes to me as if it is a very coherent sentence, I think that what you said means exactly what that coherent sentence means to me. 
I right. mean, you said it, and there it was, and I and and, and I didn't have any problem understanding uh, the combination of words as you put them together for me, and so I think I got it, and yet I don't. And sometimes that can be something very difficult to get the nuance of, and as a result, uh, we can become quite stuck even in our paradigmical possibilities. And this also has to do with aptitude and IQ. Um, I mean, if you're a person who's not good at math, there are certain mathematical relationships that no matter how much we talk about them, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, I see what you're talking about. No, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't got a clue <laughs> what's going on here. And, and as a result, we have to be a bit humble and realizing that none of us have ever been born with every aptitude that's out there. And as a result, when we're talking to people who are trying to express to us how they think or how they feel or how they see or how they understand, uh, it's quite possible that without regard to whether they're brilliant or quite, uh, quite common or mundane, that, uh, that they may be actually saying things we don't have the current capacity to actually understand. True. That is a humbling thought and that's a thought that most of us don't want to ever admit we should have and yet i think there is plenty of psychological uh, studies to indicate that we have those very kind of cross-cultural or subcultural differences of how we experience certain ideas and whether or not those ideas in their nuances are something we're even capable of experiencing at this point in time in our lives the last 45 minutes, we've been talking about elementary things, very basic things. I mean, the things on the bottom. I mean, so simple, okay? Well, before um, we go on to something else, let's ask, uh, let's ask Daryl. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to bring Daryl yeah, and yeah. Diana into the conversation. Hello, Daryl. What's going on? Hello. Just a lot of listening. And uh, uh, according to what I'm hearing, a, uh, an attempt to understand the conveyed meanings of what's being said. You know, to me, what I'm hearing more than anything else is that, you know, if we add to the challenge of uh, not really necessarily wanting to listen to each other in the first place, which is common among mankind, obviously, if we add the complexity of our inability at times to convey meaning uh, of our thoughts and then uh, consequently the perception of the one that we're trying to convey these perception of the one trying to convey these meanings to uh, we have a real challenge and uh, you know maybe if we present it in uh, that form that that maybe people will be more, more responsive to it. You know, people generally like a challenge. <laughs> this is quite a challenge here when you think about it. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Um, I was sent a yeah. private message. They wanted to know what's on my my shirt. I mean, Bob, look at that. I mean, you're afraid of these. Uh, oh, 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 <laughs> these oh, alligators. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, alligator. yeah, oh. I mean, Bob was so afraid of these alligators, and I've got an alligator. Uh, I don't know anything about the gators here in Florida, but I know when Bob Graves is in Florida, he's scared yeah. to death. I mean, you got you got to watch out for those alligators here. But, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> rock star. <laughs> oh, they're pretty good. I think they win a lot of games, don't they? Yeah. Oh, those kind of games. Games. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Diana. What uh, we we we've, we've been chatting here uh, for a while. Uh, what's your impression of what we've been talking about here? Um, when when I saw the um, excuse me, oh cough there. Uh, when I saw the uh, teaser for this uh, for this show and the uh, impediment that determinant language might present to communication, that piqued my interest because I, you know, in my training as a scientist, I got very accustomed to the use of determinant language in this, um, and, and found it to be very good because you had all of the intended meanings in a list and you knew exactly what you were talking about when you were talking to a colleague. Now, as an impediment to language, that's intriguing. 
And I'd really like to know more about how that works because... Um, the impediment would be along these lines that once I have learned how to use a, 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 a nomenclature that is more deterministic, I have a tendency to hear all words as if they all are deterministic. And the truth is the language that is used by the general public is in a constant state of, um, uh, of synchronic drift. People are using it creatively and differently and, and poetically. And as a result, it, uh, it, you know, it's really all over the place. It's not really um, the kind of thing. I lost my earpiece. <laughs> not but good, not good. It's, 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 so it's all over the, the, the place. Uh, and so the problem there can be twofold. Number one, if I am hearing words that are the person's not using in an agreed upon deterministic disciplined way, then, uh, but I think I am, then, then I'm pegging them as saying something they're not really even trying to say. And the other thing is that although we do use deterministic language in a discipline as a scientist, um, there can be still nonetheless a, a certain larger domain of meaning than we may want. And in fact, in some disciplines, some words are actually misused. Uh, like in sound engineering, we tend to use the word uh, phase in two very different ways. Uh, we may talk about where within the, uh, the, the sound wave uh, from its uh, compression to rarefaction, uh, wh where within that, uh, that wave form are we really beginning and ending, or we could even be using the word phase to refer to the polarity of the signal. And those are really two different concepts technically, but we use the same damn word for them both. And so, and, and that's a, and, and in the musician, you know, uh, you, uh, you, you can get an amplifier that has a, uh, that has a vibrato thing on it and it's really tremolo. And then we have this thing on our guitar called a tremolo bar, but it's really a vibrato bar, you know? So we're even misusing the terms. So, uh, you know, uh, but does you know, that what, answer your question though a little bit more? Well, yeah, you know, where I was headed with that is, when you have people discussing something and they disagree and they disagree fundamentally with the usage of a word um the word that comes to my mind is faith and you've got uh one person who believes faith to be one thing another person who believes faith to be another thing would some degree of determinants be a good idea or is that indeterminate usage, is, is, it, is, is it derailing the discussion? Well, that the, the, the difference would depend on this. I mean, scientifically, when I talk about, say, the boiling point of a particular liquid, I am trying to narrow in on a very specific temperature for a very specific uh, compound, you know? Uh, so there, I think the determinant is, is very helpful. But when it comes to more of the humanitarian fields, uh, you know, the humanities, uh, the, the psychology and sociology, or even linguistics, here, uh, since faith can mean so many different things to different people, or, or nuanced in a very different way, if we try to come up with just a deterministic language, we're going to eliminate uh, half of the reality here. Uh, because we're going to try and force people to just use this word in a particular way when and they have no other word to use to describe what they want to say. And so there are some words in some ways of talking more towards the, the philosophical end than the, than the empirical end, where deterministic language doesn't, doesn't serve the purpose. It needs to be poetic. It needs to be kind of loosey-goosey. And, and it needs to be kind of in the neighborhood. And, and, and the domain is shaved down by various what we may call anaphoric, cataphoric, and contextual issues that help to narrow in on what the words really might be meaning. Uh, d does, does that uh, kind I mean, of... Uh, the thing is, do you want a situational determinant, uh, if, if I might use that? In other words, agree between yourselves on what the word means in this particular discussion. Okay, well, but you can, you let can it try mean that. other things other times. Okay. Well, you, right, you can try that, but, but if we're trying to have a conversation where we're trying to understand, uh, say, my faith or your faith, then uh, if, if we try to come up with a determinate agreement here, we might be eliminating from the get-go uh, <laughs> the conversation, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that could be what's going on. And I think this is what happens with, say, Aaron Ra. Uh, he wants to define faith as as as, re, as as possessing a very specific domain, 
to the point where he denies that it has any connection with the cognitive concept of of uh, resonating or trusting in a in in, in a in, in, in an idea. And that's pretty uh, much where I was coming from. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, as a result, I think that determinate language helps us in a discipline where we're trying to get very scientific and very empirical. But I think the determinate language when it comes to um, uh, other things can get in the way. Now, when it comes to philosophy, we might talk about, you know, ontology. Now, what we mean with an ontological argument can be very varied in what we're trying to talk about, but we can agree at least on the concept of what we mean when we say this is an ontological approach. You know, so philosophy will have some deterministic words that really kind of talk about the nature or the character of an idea, but it doesn't necessarily work for when you're trying to express what is the specific ontological idea you want to express. So, you know, I, I think that therefore we find that the determinant meaning has has its use and it also can get in the way if you're trying to treat everything as if it ought to possess a determinate meaning. Okay, I think I got you there. Um, <coughs> Let me see if I can insert something that might be useful uh, when people are looking at Koine Greek, for instance. Uh, some, t some people take a pathway and they use a determinate nomenclature to speak about, uh, let's say, uh, nouns. And, and adjectives in this way, they're going to use a, a certain kind of case system. Some people take a five-case approach. Some people take an eight-case approach. Now let's juxtapose both. Both have the nominative. Both have the genitive. But with one, it goes a little bit further. You have the genitive and the, the ablative or ablative. And so this genitive and ablative, they have the same form whereas over here in the 5K system, they just call it the genitive. Okay, if you go a little bit further, in the 5K system, it's the dative, and it covers everything over here that these people over here in the 8K system are talking about dative, locative, and instrumental. And so if you're talking to someone who has studied the 8K system, and you talk you know, about the instrumental uh, case or the uh, locative, uh, it's much different than the da dative, okay? But if you talk to an eight, uh, five case uh, person, that is a person who has studied it through uh, that particular nomenclature, it's you know, the dative includes all of the notions within these particular three categories. And then you get the, uh, to the accusative and then both uh, swap the accusative understandings and then you get to the vocative. And my point is one has five, one has eight. Now you would assume that the eight case system would be far more um, detailed, and the opposite is actually true, because when people started looking through the lens of an 8K system, what they did with it, they said, well, this is locative, and they determined that this was more about form, and it had nothing to do with form, and so for form criticism suffered a big blow, and, and some people will understand what I'm talking about, yeah. but over here with the 5K system, what you can do is you're not looking at form as being function. You're, you're looking at the dative as just the form, but you're saying the dative has various functions more than just, you know, dative, locative, and instrumental. And so it becomes a brand new ball game over here. So the five case uh, system thinkers are much more detailed in analysis than the eight, eight case uh, system thinkers. Do you see where I'm coming from? Yes. So if you're talking to two, if you're talking to the two, the two groups, and you say something is in the genitive, and these people over here, assuming, uh, you know, well, but you also have the ablative or ablative that you need to speak about too, and these people over here are saying, no, that's, it's, 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 it's the same form. I mean, you're you're really confusing something here. You need to focus on function instead of form, and that's true. And so linguistically speaking, there's been a lot of dance, and that same thing applies across the board, because when I talk about models of faith, uh, I'm talking about faith. Um, there is something called the affective uh, model of faith. Faith is knowledge. We can talk about faith as belief, faith as trust, faith as a doxastic venture, faith as a sub or a non-doxastic venture, faith as hope, uh, faith as virtue, and faith even beyond the orthodoxy, namely of theism itself. 
And most people don't want to go that far with it, but each one of these categories is a huge umbrella, and underneath that umbrella, there are many, many, many different kinds of usages. And this is something that Arn Ra is failing to address. People use words like they want to. You are your own author. You author all of your words. And sometimes you will use someone else's usage, but you don't have to, correct? Correct. So when you're speaking to a person, you are the author of your own words. If you choose to use, let's say, the most popular usage of a word, you may do that. So if you're talking about faith and you want to say, well, let's stick to a particular definition, uh, who came up with this definition, and why should we use this definition only for this particular argument? Sometimes people make up a definition for a word that fails the argument. It can't go full, full circle simply because they want to win the argument. And in linguistics, this is, you know, a red flag. Well, you don't do stuff like that simply because it's, 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 it's not just ignorant, it's stupid. And this right. is very much yeah. what Aaron Ra does a lot. Simply, he's trying to win an argument, but he's being disingenuous linguistically and non-linguistically. This is not the manner in which human beings actually do things. It reminds me of Eric Hoven and Saitan Bruggenkate. They have the song and dance, and they're going to you know, be right. very much the bully, uh, the bull in the china closet coming out with, you know, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? And they want to base it on ultimate authority. And here, Arn Ra, he has this ultimate authority. He has this one <laughs> definition of faith. And boy, is that fundamentalism uh, at its worst. Uh, I mean, that, that's the well, best case scenario of fundamentalism, fundamentalism right there. And I love Aaron to death, but for some reason he can't get past that, so I'm going to be patient with him. At some point he's going to shift because I think that atheists are going to get tired of being um, misinformed. Well, so you've actually really brought up two more uh, issues to answer Diana's comment about uh, you know the problem with deterministic language. Uh, by uh, by being uh, deterministic, there um, he's not he's he's not being open to uh, some of the various drifted meanings uh, or within its entire domain. Now, the other thing that you mentioned is this about the case eight case versus the five case system. Whenever we have a an, an area of thought that possesses, say, numerous terms, people will have a tendency to overly determinize what those terms mean and give them each their own little subdomain and those subdomains don't move. Right. But however, when we have a, a, in a particular language only a couple of words that are somewhat synonymous, those languages, th those words can now have, they have a great deal of freedom to, to go far and wide, uh, close and far. Uh, they, they can do all sorts of things. And, and we're more apt to do them because we find that we have to use them poetically because we haven't narrowed it down. So in other words, the, the, the language that has sometimes the far more categorical terms uh, within a sub-idea uh, gets stuck in those categories and right. can't move out of them, whereas the, the language that might have a, a, a smaller set of categories can actually then have a wide and nuanced right. and almost uncategorical um, uh, aspect of t uh, of nuance there that is just very free, and uh, and so that's that's part of the problem here that we also see in language. So therefore, what we find is that isn't language just an amazing thing, and that it, it it can be very in some ways very precise, in very ways very general, and in very ways very free, in some ways very uh, distinct. It's so I mean it, it's it's just an amazing thing. The more you learn about language and how we use it. Uh, it's just an amazing thing to me. I find it fascinating uh, uh, you know, to, to, to study human usage of language. We use, and here's the thing, every human being who speaks is a genius to a degree they don't even understand. They use language in all of these nuanced ways without even understanding uh, how we might actually categorize as linguists all those neat little ways that they they use things like they use nouns, but they use noun phrases. They use uh, prepositions. I mean, some people don't even know what any of these grammatical terms might mean, and yet they use these uh, grammatical forms and uh, and the poetic uh, a stretching of them all the time. And they know exactly what they're trying to say and do. And they and and the communication sometimes is uh, amazingly right. successful in spite of just how complex it is. 
For instance, when you talk to five, five case uh, advocates, they're simply trying to get the student to focus on function. Let me read some of the functions, namely of the genitive. We have the descriptive genitive, which a lot of you would know that is the apparatic genitive, and the possessive genitive, the genitive relationship. We have the holative, some people call that the partitive. We have the attributive, we have the attributed genitive, we have the genitive of material, genitive of content, genitive in simple apposition, genitive of apposition, genitive of destination. Uh, some people call that direction or purpose genitive. Uh, same thing, predicate genitive, genitive of subordination, genitive of production, genitive of product, genitive of separation, genitive of source, namely origin, genitive of comparison, subjective genitive, objective genitive, plenary genitive, a genitive of price or value or quantity, genitive of time, genitive of place, genitive of means, genitive of agency, genitive of absolute, genitive of reference, genitive of association, and so on and so on. So we get into a plethora of functions within the genitive, and I could go on and on and on all, all night long, but basically what we're dealing with is the X of Y and how the X of Y has many, many functions. But oftentimes in philosophy, Diana, people look at the X of Y one way, and it's a one-way street. They can only see it functioning one way, and that's simply not true. And so hopefully my analogy or uh, juxtaposition, you know, saying this guy over here, he's holding to the genitive that is in an eight case system. He sees the genitive in, in a very small, shallow way. It's, it's more about form. The guy over here, he sees the genitive as, you know, yeah, it's the form, but it has so many functions. Do you see the difference? Yeah, definitely. Um, that, does that help to a degree? To a degree. And I guess what I want to see is more people come to understand that. Right. Um, and fewer people want to play games with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like this. If uh, you and I agreed uh, and said, you know, let's use the Greek usage uh, and uh, of a particular term, Let's say pistis. Uh, let's take one of Paul's usages of pistis. He moves from faith to faith. And in that context, what he meant after critical exegesis, and, and please understand, this is what's going wrong today in the great debate. People are reading into what other people are saying. That means that they are eisegeting. Exegesis means to deal with what's there and lead that out. In other words, if I want to exegete a text, I'm only going to deal with what's there. I'm not going to read in between the lines. I'm not going to add something to it. And in other words, if we had people who were doing critical exegesis, whether it be in the biblical text or a biology book, it's necessary to learn how to do critical exegesis. People in the great debate are not exegetically sound. That's not what they're doing. Most people are just talking back and forth, reading between the lines. If I say something to atheists and theists alike, typically they read into what I'm saying. They're right. not trying to tease out my intent. I've never had an atheist in this studio that was disciplined exegetically. And I've had a lot of atheists. I'm talking about a lot of the top atheists who market atheism for a living. And so they are not good at exegesis, that is, dealing with what's there and leading that out alone. They are more about trying to market one thing. That's why the definition of faith has to be one thing. They're going to focus in on that one song and dance because they think that really goes full circle with argument. It does not. It fails. Language is not, it doesn't work that way. And so what, what happens, you, you, you find people like Saitan Bruggenkate, you know, you know, the manner in which he's using knowledge, he conflates all the time. Uh, he's playing a shell game. Uh, he doesn't even understand that he's using it in different ways when he's speaking, but he will define it one way. Right. And so yeah. he will come on the show and say, you know, knowledge is justified true belief, but he doesn't even understand the various theories of justification, nor does he understand the various theories of truth. Nor does he understand the various theories of belief, does he? No. 
Okay. No, not and so, at all. Yeah. Nor does he understand the different theories of knowledge. And that's my point with Aaron Ra. Aaron Ra, he's pitching faith as if there isn't faith outside of orthodox uh, theism. And that's not true. Outside of words. Right. And yeah. so... That, you know, I, I do have to move along soon. I have an, actually have an appointment coming up here. Right. But you know, one thing I'd like to say kind of in conclusion is this. Some of the thoughts that we have that we would like to communicate to others are thoughts that, that are very linguistically shaped. And, and fortunately, I can find words that, uh, that really do a great job of, of sharing with you uh, my thoughts. But some of the thoughts that I have are, are, you know, we, we, we think in, in, in clusters of, 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 of notions and ideas, we speak in a linear string of sounds. These are two different ways of, of actually even putting a, an idea together. And as a result, there are many thoughts that I can have that are actually in, in, in various ways inarticulate. But if I'm going to express them, I'm going to have to try to find words that approximate which means that if you want to understand someone, you have to recognize when the words they're using are, are actually far more precise and perhaps even deterministic, and when the words they're using are really just trying to get you in the neighborhood. And, and to communicate with others does involve uh, recognizing that difference and being open to the fact that that difference does exist. So determinate language can sometimes help us to communicate about very precise things. But other times, attempting to use language or giving language an overdeterminant uh, sense of meaning is a way of ignoring the meaning a person is attempting to communicate. Yeah, and you mentioned exegesis and eisegesis. <coughs> One of the things I'm coming to see, and please redirect me if I'm starting to go off the rails with this. One of the things I'm starting to see is a lot of people today are eisegeting their Christianity into the text, which is describing a Christianity right. totally unlike theirs. Right. Exactly. Yes. True. That you was got perfect. It. Yeah. You got. You got it. Okay. Let, let, oh, let me share this with you. At least I. At least I'm starting to get there. Okay. Yeah. Let, let 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 me explain this. If I talk about the genitive of, let's say, material versus the genitive of content. Let's see if you can deal with this. Picture in your mind's eye a bucket, uh, um, let's say the bucket of iron. Now, if I say the bucket of iron is actually the material that the bucket is made of, and then I say the bucket of iron, you would get that, right? Yeah, you're talking about an iron bucket. Iron bucket, yeah. Okay, now if I say the genitive of content, I could say the bucket of balls, right? Yeah, or okay. you could even say the bucket of iron, meaning the iron that's in the bucket. So, I could say both are the X of Y, correct? Yes, absolutely. One would be the material, one would be the content. And so this is why exegesis is critical, and we have to look at the intent, namely, of the author. You can use the same word, but that doesn't mean that it has the same uh, deep structure, correct? Yeah, right. so right. the, we're using the same form and structures, but we're, but we're using them to convey completely different, even unrelated ideas. And so this is what I'm talking about people playing shell games. They will say, I'm dealing with X of Y. I'm dealing with X of Y. Well, okay, slow it down. Um, let's not talk about form all day long. Let's talk about function. Let's look at this X of Y. Bucket of balls, bucket of iron. Well, it could be. A bucket of iron is the content. Iron's in the bucket. That could be true. But you could be saying the bucket of iron, the bucket which is made of iron, correct? Yep. Both of them are there. True. And so I could go on and on and on. I could give you a plethora of ideas of how to interpret that. And that's what our brains do. Okay? When we hear, like Bob was describing, and I applaud him, he gave an excellent what? Critical exegesis of what goes on concerning hearing, the hearing apparatus. Now that deals with the brain and what we do with it lexically, okay? And so we have this internal lexicon, and we have all this external stuff going on, and Bob's saying, we don't always interpret it the same way, so we have to be careful, don't we? We have to be patient and kind. We can't read between the lines. We've got to 
spend some time and critically exegete it and instead of reading something into it. How often do you see in the great debate and the great debate the great debate people critically exegeting what has been said by the other person in the debate? They're not even listening to the other person. <laughs> right, they're just waiting to speak. In other words, you said the X Y, you said the X Y, you know. And this this is the this is the gaming that's going on and I keep saying, "Wow, this is tragic." And so when people come to a show like this, they say, you know, these guys are too boring. Let's turn it off. Uh, I would rather go over here where they are arguing. No, it's the bucket of iron. No, it's the bucket of balls. Oh, excuse me. The bucket is made of iron. The bucket is full of iron. Which is it? Now, I would argue that if I said the bucket of iron, I'm going to tell you I don't know whether the speaker is talking about the bucket is made of iron or whether it contains iron. I don't know which yet. So this is going to require of me to do a syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis. I'm going to have to have all of the elements that I've been talking about for years on this program, correct? I can tell you about a, a sad story in my life. It's, I've, been, I've been carrying a heavy load. My life is sometimes a bucket of iron. <laughs> I mean, you know, here, here we're getting poetic with it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is great because the analogy comes through, you know. Uh, and, and so language is, language is just a beautiful and, and sure. very flexible thing. Uh, I, I, I hate to do this to you, but I really do have to go in. I'm hey, you take care, Bob. After. But um, yeah, and I enjoyed the discussion. And you know, it was awesome, uh, the contributions and even the questions and comments <coughs> that we got from, from uh, Daryl and Diana and so what have you. But anyway, let's, let's make an effort to communicate with each other and, and, and not be so rigid and, and recognize that there's even difficulty not just in understanding each other because of the way we speak, but also because of what it is we're actually even capable of being aware of and sensitive to. This is also a very difficult part of communication. And the more determinant we are or less determinant we are in, in, in the inappropriate way, the more we just, we just isolate ourselves and don't really end up communicating. So true. Thanks a lot for coming on the show tonight, Bob. I'll see you later. Take care. Awesome. Awesome. Take care, Bob. Be good. Take care. Okay, uh, Daryl, what say you? We've been talking about a bucket of iron and bucket of balls. Well, I think it goes back to this is maybe not the bottom line, but for me it's somewhat of a bottom line. That is, how bad do we really want to communicate or understand one another? Uh, because I, you know, I'm convinced it can be done if we work hard enough at it, but uh, it seems like too many times the opposite is true. You know, uh, we're, that's not the goal is, is to really communicate, understand one another and possibly come away with uh, more clarity and uh, possibly more agreement. Wouldn't that be tragic if uh, we actually began to understand one another, find out that we agree with one another more than we thought we did. I so agree. Oh, that would we be would... horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, think about this. If we learn to turn to each other instead of away from each other, if we tried as hard to understand one another as we tried to be understood, what would that landscape look like? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something else. So did you have any other comments to make? I don't want to be long-winded tonight. I think that I've over-talked today. <clears throat> Too much talk. Well, I'll say, you know, excellent points made. And I uh, agree with uh, Diana. I wish more people would, uh, you know, consider these things. Sounds good. Diana, any final thoughts? I guess my big thought is I, I hope, I, I wish that more people would come by here, take a listen to what's going on, drop their agendas, if you want to put it that way. I know a lot of people have something in mind. They want another person to believe as they do or think as they do or behave as they do. But that isn't what the story is. Maybe if we can come to a, a better understanding. And this is a great place to do it. 
So I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more of that. Do you see now why suspending judgment, you know, you know, bucket of iron, what does that mean? I mean, why, why would I jump through hoops to say, oh, I know what that means. I don't know what it means. It's, I can write that down. What does it mean? In other words, I could ask, you know, anyone walking down the street, bucket of iron, what does that mean? People are more willing to tell you what it means without knowing anything about it. And that's where atheism and theism are today. People who are willing to just jump out there and say, I know. I've got justification. And I'm saying that if they would analyze carefully uh, the theory of justification, I should say the theories of justification, uh, they would not be so zealous. And so I'm a bit cautious, and yes, I'm very skeptical, not scenically, uh, if I can use it that way, but I'm a skeptical because there there is a discipline to saying when someone says bucket of iron, I don't know whether that person is talking about the bucket is made of iron or whether uh, it contains iron. I don't know what they're saying. And so I'm going to hold my judgment until I find out. And so right now I don't know, but I know more about the bucket of iron than I do the question of God, whether there is a God or not. And so people are leaping all the time. And we would like to pretend like, you know, I don't have faith or I do have faith or whatever. But it, but it's more gaming than it is anything. It's entertainment. And yes, it's big business. People are making a lot of money off of it. And that scares me. And so with that said, we're going to get out of here. And hopefully you can have a nice evening. If you like the show, like it. If you don't like the show, just let us know why. But we love you much in every way. And we hope that, you know, your week will be good. And uh, if you have some questions, just send them our way. And uh, we're so thankful to have you guys in our lives. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, all.